Adrian Nicole LeBlanc wrote an impressive and important portrait of life in a very specific part of New York. She will talk about her book and her work in general with another strong lady, I must say, Ruth Oldesio. Ruth is an expert on American issues and has something significant in common with our guest. Adrian Nicole LeBlanc and Ruth Oldenziel both studied at Smith College at the same time. After all these years, it's about time they caught up and talk to each other again. Tonight, Ruth will start by introducing Adrian and her book, Random Family. Then Adrian will speak for about 30 minutes. And without intermission, Ruth, Ruth uh, will interview Adrian. And um, you will all get a chance to ask questions. Um, for now, please switch off mobile phones. And um, may I ask Ruth to come and help me? I am very, very honored to introduce the work of Adrian Nicole Leblanc, <laughs> or Leblanc, or uh, investigative reporter, sociologist by training, who you could actually call uh, the Margaret Mead of the Bronx uh, in documenting the lives of two Puerto Rican teenage mothers, Jessica and, and Coco, and uh, their extended families. She does so with extraordinary respect, empathy, and unsentimentality that stands firmly in an ethnographic tradition. She uncovers how America's underclass in New York, uh, the so-called no-go areas in the Bronx, lives and survives. These are the people that middle-class America experiences as a foreign tribe, other, alien, strange, and most of all, threatening. They are infamous and stereotyped as teenage mothers, or Reagan called them, the welfare queens, Grandmothers of 35 years old, child molesters, drug pins, addicts, living on the other side of the track, right under America's nose, but unseen, unheard, unforgotten, and if noticed at all, stereotyped in newspapers report and abstracted in social policy papers. LeBlanc pulls us back in showing both the abuse, violence, mistakes, and the loyalty, family life, and love. She renders the other into the familiar and the aliens into a family. At the end of the book, you want to ask her, hey, how is, how is Coco doing? They have become our family. But this is not just a sociological study of how the other half lives, which was the title of a very famous um, sociological study, um, Muckrackers tradition in the 1920s of Jacob Rees. This is not suffice, so she's more than just Margaret Mead. Random Family is also a literary masterpiece. LeBlanc is also an American Dostoevsky or an urban Steinbeck. She has composed her book in lean and clean prose that sounds like poetry in the economy of expression, in the music, musical in its beat. Like a novel, it, it also has a character development because her investigative journalism covered uh, more than 10 years of field work, and her narrative skills allows her to craft a storyline of discovery and coming of age. Many readers have commented on how it reads as a novel. You want, well, reading, and I found this to be true, you want a happy ending, and you forget it is reality. And then suddenly it stops. You want it to go on because it's such a beautiful prose but you also realize that life is going on. The book is also extraordinary because it's historically momentous. It chronicles the lives of an underclass left behind by new policies and indifference that marked the end of the New Deal from the uh, Republican Reagan through the new Democrat Clinton, ending, as he said, welfare as we know it. Well, through this book, we realize we don't know anything. It, buzzwords at the time were res taking responsibility, family values, and so forth. How hollow those words sound. In the face of the demeaning and humiliating force of poverty through Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administration, LeBlanc shows the portrait of resilience, agency, and ultimate humanity, or as she describes elsewhere, 
in the face of an ongoing wave of poverty wash, washing over these families with no end in sight. Big words and abstractions of social policy or easy journalistic shorthands do not appear in the book. Instead, she narrates through details of daily life people who live in a constant crisis and drama, trying to eke out a respectful, a respectful existence despite the odds. And remarkably, no one, none of the characters ever blames the system or the state. Self-reliance and family loyalty is prized. Random Family started as a 1988 fast-paced piece for Rolling Stones about the flamboyant 22-year-old boy George and half a million a week earning drug pin. But after more than 10 years of field work, uh, LeBlanc turned it into a three-generational family saga in the Bronx of sheer beauty and disturbing social injustice that also manages to transcend historical circumstances into a profound human experience. We meet 19-year-old Puerto Rican uh, Jessica flaunting her beauty who makes men stop and turn their heads when she enters the street. She knows her sexual power and uses it to the fullest. By page six, she's pregnant, abandoned, suicidal, and while her stomach is pumped, learns she is pregnant again with twins from another. She dreams of rescue and, and prints on a white horse, and for a brief moment, her dream comes through when she meets 20-year-old good-looking boy George, the cocaine drug dealer, who drives custom-made Mercedes-Benz and showers his kindness and money in exchange for fierce loyalty and merciless punishment and beatings if the trust is broken. He warns, if I can't trust you, I can kill you, and he does. For a short while, he is king. Now he is in prison, serving life still making his presence and power felt beyond prison walls. Caesar, another, uh, Jessica's younger brother, by another father, at 14, acting as the husband to his cocaine-sniffing mother, who inevitably ends up in jail, fathering children with different women along the way. We see him change over time from a macho adolescence to an introspective man, who ends up cherishing the ordinary details of his daughter's life from inside the prison walls. And then there's Coco, Caesar's first life, love, pregnant when they are 14 years old. She's ordinary, too kind, no drugs, no addiction, ends up with five kids from four different fathers. She straddles between the desire to getting out of this life and her fierce loyalty to her family in poverty-stricken and drug-laced neighborhood. LeBlanc presents us with an intimate portrait of the urban poor. It is where, and I quote here, better, better than was the true marker of success. Thick and fat was better than thin and hungry. Family fights indoors, even if everyone could hear them, were better than taking private business to the street. Heroin was bad. But crack was worse. A girl who had four kids by two boys was better than a girl who had four by three, unquote. It's a world where women use their sexuality to gain leverage, and men struggle for gaining manly respect through having many girlfriends and dealing drugs as a very sensible alternative uh, to the low-end wages in dead-end jobs. Bodies get groomed, tattooed, hurt, beaten, shot, pregnant. It's about human weaknesses of jealousy, power, but also dignity, generosity, and love. Her book is investigative journalism, it is literature, and it is poetry all at once. Please welcome Adrian LeBanc. When I hear descriptions of the book, I alternate between massive anxiety and a huge sense of dread, <laughs> because I think, who's going to want to read that? It sounds insane. Um, but I'm hoping to convince you that by the end of this evening. Um, thank you for that great introduction, and thank you, Monique, for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be here, and sort of an extraordinary experience after being uh, working in this project for about 12 years from beginning to end. Um, I, I feel, even though it's been a year since the book has been out, I feel an, sort of slow coming out of I sort of feel like a groundhog that's just sort of popped up 
<laughs> and sort of shocked that there's a wider world from the world that I've been in for a while. Um, I, I'm going to just speak briefly uh, about how I came to do the work that I do and then read to you short passages from the book to introduce some of my favorite people. Um, I'm a journalist by profession. I write primarily about, not so much anymore, but initially about teenagers. And uh, I came to my work, my first piece of journalism was actually about teenagers in my hometown in um, the States. They, there was a, 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 they call them cluster suicides, which was a, a 11 young people uh, committed suicide in a period of about a year and a half. And this is not so common in the States, but there have been sort of periods where this has occurred. And um, my first real piece of journalism was an exploration of what actually had taken place in my hometown to perhaps contribute to that disaster. And as often happens in journalism, um, you, you get tagged for a subject. So I became the sort of troubled teen journalist. So I would get calls to write about teenagers and drugs, teenagers and alcoholism, teenagers and crime. <laughs> You name it, if a kid was in trouble, I would get a call to go out and write about them. Um, I, I really actually love writing about teenagers for, I mean, the practical reason that I really enjoy spending time with them. Because once you actually get access to, to an adolescent as a source, um, it's pretty wide open access. There's not a lot of, I mean, they sort of decide that they like you or they don't. They decide that they trust you or they don't. And they sort of let you in their lives and you can go about your work and they sort of go on about their business. Whereas I found when I write about adults, there's often a sort of very long and complicated courtship and a lot of sort of ongoing encouragement and assurance. And the ratio of um, interestingness in that uh, dynamic is lower than I find with kids because I, I really just want to be able to spend time with people. As, as a writer, I also don't tend to ask a lot of questions. It may be partly why it takes me so long to do my work, but I... I'm actually shy when I'm in the field, and I feel quite hesitant about what it is I'm trying to document. I mean, I sort of get an assignment. I know that I'm writing about, say, teenagers and gangs, or in this case, um, I was writing a profile of Boy George, who was this extraordinary young drug dealer who was a millionaire by the time he was 18. So I knew that was the assignment, but after, beyond that, I actually don't know what I'm looking for. And I think once you start asking people questions, you're already beginning to frame the story. So I try very, very hard to stay still when I'm in the field. And by that, I mean literally trying to just be with people quietly, uh, observantly, but not in terms of um, inserting myself, even verbally, insofar as I can manage that. It's a very awkward thing uh, much of the time because you are supposed to be a reporter and people have the idea that you're supposed to be asking questions. But young people tend to be more flexible when you explain to them, oh, I'll ask you questions when I know what to say, or I just want to see what your life is like, can I hang out with you? Or one thing I often find to be very helpful is I explain to them, it's sort of like making a movie, that if I were a filmmaker and I were, wanted to come into your life and document what your life is like, I need to see your bedroom, I need to meet your parents, I need to meet your girlfriend, I'd like to see you with your friends, I'd like to know where you hang out. Um, if you write in a journal and you're willing to share that with me, that would be great. But I try to actually have them take me through the actual physical um, spaces of their lives. And, and uh, so I don't ask questions, sometimes for months. Um, and what was very interesting in this project, when a piece of it appeared in a magazine, I think nine years after I started, there were some people that I'd known, I didn't even know what their last names were. And I didn't even know how old it, some of them were. So when fact checkers came along and said, you know, how old is she or whatever, I would say it never occurred to me to ask them <laughs> because I was actually just trying to see what was relevant to them in their own experience, meaning that I think people tend to reveal the things that are important to them over time if you pay close attention. They make references to the people they care about. They spend time doing the things that they enjoy. Um, they complain about the things that bother them. Their facial expressions reveal... Um, moments of conflict or you know, discomfort. So I think, but, but the hard thing for me, at least as a journalist, is to figure out how do you stomach that silence. It's awkward enough sometimes being quiet with people you know really well. And it can be incredibly excruciating to be silent with people that you don't know at all. Especially when you're in the inner city of New York and you're the skinny white woman among a bunch of Hispanic drug dealers who think you're a police officer. Um, so uh, 
but but outside of enjoying writing about teenagers, I actually have a real political interest in writing about them. I think they're one of the few remaining groups, at least in the U.S., that you can openly criticize without being considered a bigot. You can make incredible statements about young people, incredibly insulting sort of silly generalizations about children and young people that you couldn't really get away with with any other group anymore. I mean, it's fairly common for people to say, you know, I hate teenagers or whatever it is, make these wild um, assertions. And I think that they're a subject worthy of scrutiny like any other group of people or any other kind of um, beat as a writer. Certainly in the U.S. there's a huge obsession about youth and adolescence and all the related issues that we project onto teenagers as well as those that may or may not actually exist in their own experience. Um, I think they're an incredible way into a certain take on the world because I think teenagers tend to live um, multiple lives. They exist in the adult world and they operate in the adult world, but they also have very private worlds among their friends and also within their own imaginative lives. And I think they're an incredibly rich way into a kind of way into a culture to tell you some of what's going on. I also think it's a lot of work writing about teenagers because since most, obviously, adult journalists were once adolescents, they feel a lot of confidence about what it means to have been a teenager. But I think if you're actually trying to document things as they move historically, it changes all the time. So whatever it meant to me to be a teenager, I don't actually know whether or not that's true now. Some things may be useful in trying to make connections with people, but I'm quite suspicious of a kind of confidence that just because I was young once, I know whatever it means. Um, the other, I guess the other thing about um, teenagers that inspires me as a writer is that I feel deeply challenged by them almost all the time. Um, and it's not just the idealism or the sort of intensity or the questioning or the, the longing or whatever it is they feel, but there's a way in which I find generally with adolescents that they assume, um, and this is one of the themes of the book, which is the, the families that we create, our chosen families, not the families that you inherit by blood, but the, the people that you choose to um, share your intimate life with. And I find that teenagers tend to accept people quite wholeheartedly. Uh, there's a way that whatever you come along with as a young person, whether your dad's an alcoholic or whatever your sort of uh, strife is in life, um, there's a way in which young people seem to just accept that as part of the person in, in sort of... Um, not really weigh the implications of those features in a person's life. Whereas if you talk to women, say, in their 30s who are in the singles world dating, they sort of assess various kinds of characteristics of people. Like he comes from this kind of family and he had one wife. And you know what I'm saying? They sort of actually feel that people can be weighed or that they can be, um, what do you call it? That they can actually be somehow calculated as whole people. And there's a way in which kids just generally don't do that. And I find that quite inspiring and really, really challenging narratively. Um, this particular story I came to uh, because I was writing about crime. A lot of young journalists in the States start off on the crime beat. I started off on the crime beat in part because I had a full-time job. And the only time I had to report was in the evening. And I liked writing about kids. So the kids I tended to write about were kids that were on the street at night after my day job let out, and, um, and I started to do a lot of street reporting. It was the late 80s, and in New York City, it was the peak of the crack boom, and uh, there were just lots and lots of drug arrests uh, of minority men for drug dealing. And in the U.S., it's, I would say, nearly impossible to write about crime without writing about the issue of poverty, because they just go hand in hand. It's absolutely impossible to write about crime without writing about race, but um, the criminal justice system just dovetails with you know, communities uh, um, who live in poverty. And I immediately found my way to the federal courthouse and the state courthouse. And um, the historical relevance of this time later became clear to me, which was, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Rockefeller drug laws and the sort of harsh sentencing um, guidelines that were implemented in the U.S. in the war on drugs, which have now about to be remedied finally, but they were very, very punishing sentences, and um, people were sentenced to prison not based on, they were sentenced based on the amount of drugs they were carrying when they were arrested. So you actually would get 
plateaus of 5 to 10 to 15 years, depending on the actual weight of the drugs you were carrying. It didn't matter if you'd been arrested before. It didn't matter if you had a violent history. It actually mattered how much powder cocaine you actually had in your pocket, and that would determine your sentence. This was done in an attempt to eradicate racism in sentencing, but it actually had the effect of locking up lots of poor minority people because they treated crack cocaine differently from powdered cocaine, so lots of white folks snort powdered coke, and a lot of poor people use crack cocaine, so the sentences were disparate. There was all kinds of chaos that resulted, but I sort of entered into the drug trade at this moment. Young people were being employed because there was another law that sentenced adults to very, very hard time for dealing drugs, so they started hiring kids because kids got less time, and it kept a distance between the actual business and their own uh, vulnerability. So it was a moment when drug dealers were hiring kids, and this was the moment I sort of hit the streets. Boy George was a very unusual young man because he actually made money in the drug business. Um, Contrary to popular belief, most people don't make much, but he made a lot, and he was a rare bird, and, uh, and it was through him that I met this whole cast of characters. I think there's probably 30 people in the book. I'm not sure. Uh, lots and lots of people. And I'm just going to read to you very briefly um, three of the people that really um, continue to mean quite a lot to me. Jessica is... Boy George had lots of girlfriends. Jessica was one of them. And I met her at the criminal courthouse in 1989, um, the book follows Jessica and her relationship with Boy George um, up through 2001. And this is the very beginning of the book. Jessica lived on Tremont Avenue on one of the poorer blocks in a very poor section of the Bronx. She dressed even to go to the store. Chance was opportunity in the ghetto, and you had to be prepared for anything. She didn't have much of a wardrobe, but she was resourceful with what she had. Her sister's Lee jeans, her best friend's earrings, her mother's T-shirts and perfume. Her appearance on the streets and her neighborhood usually caused a stir. A 16-year-old Puerto Rican girl with bright hazel eyes, a huge inviting smile, and a voluptuous shape, she radiated intimacy wherever she went. You could be talking to her in the middle of the bustle of Tremont and feel as if lovers' confidences were being exchanged beneath a tent of sheets. Guys in cars offered rides, grown men got stupid, women pursed their lips, boys made promises they could not keep. Jessica was good at attracting boys, but less good at holding on to them. She fell in love hard and fast. She desperately wanted to be somebody's real girlfriend, but she always ended up the other girl, the mistress the one they saw on the down low, the girl nobody claimed. Boys called up to her window after they dropped off their main girls, the steady ones they referred to as wives. Jessica still had her fun, but her fun was somebody else's trouble. And for a wild girl at the dangerous age, the trouble could get big. For Jessica, love was the most interesting place to go, and beauty was the ticket. She gravitated toward the enterprising boys, the boys with money, who were mostly the ones dealing drugs. Purposeful boys who pushed out of the bodega's smudge doors as if they were stepping into a party instead of onto a littered sidewalk along a potholed street. Jessica sashayed onto the pavement with a similar readiness whenever she descended the four flights of stairs from the apartment and emerged, expectant and smiling, from the paint-chipped vestibule. Lord, as Jessica's mother, thought that Jessica was a dreamer. She always wanted to have a king with a maid. I always told her that's only in books, face reality. Her dream was more upper than herself. Lourdes would caution her daughter as she disappeared down the dreary stairwell. God ain't going to have a pillow waiting for your ass when you fall landing from the sky. Outside, Jessica believed anything could happen. Usually, though, not much did. She would go off in search of one of her boyfriends or disappear with Lillian, one of her best friends. Her little brother, Caesar, would run around the neighborhood antagonizing the other children he half wanted as friends. Sometimes Jessica would cajole slices of pizza for Caesar from her dates. Her seductive ways instructed him. My sister was smart, Caesar said. She used me like a decoy, so if a guy got mad at her, he would still come around to take me out. Here's my little brother, she would say. Take him with you. More often, though, Caesar got left behind. He would sit on the broken steps of his mother's building, biding his time, watching the older boys who ruled the street. Um, Could someone flag me with time? Will you let me know when I'm 
Near 20? Okay, thank you. Um, Jessica um, was, uh, while Boy George was on trial, he was on trial, the trial lasted for three months, and she, unknown to me at the time, was um, continuing to manage some of his drug business while he was uh, in prison. And I started hanging out with her. I interviewed her, and we started going out, and um, she had access to a terrific amount of money that I didn't have the good sense to question where she actually got it. I mean, there were sort of wild nights of riding in limousines with, you know, 10 girls going out to dinner. She had lots of boyfriends. She was, um, you know, playing on with him. We were going into Chinatown um, with suitcases, not suitcases, but um, bags, and she would sort of disappear into a place occasionally. And, I, you know, I much later came to understand that she was actually making deliveries to a heroin supplier. <laughs> but I was just amazed by the whole... Um, range of her life that I, I really had no idea what was going on. Jessica, I decided to follow her around for a while, and she soon was arrested and then sent to prison. So I'd say about a year and a half into the project, she was sent to prison for 10 years. Um, and, and the charge was she actually relayed a phone message um, about a drug deal that actually involved a, a great amount of weight of heroin. So she was sent to prison based on the amount of that transaction, and she went off to prison. I then began to visit Jessica in prison. Uh, it's an incredible challenge for journalists to not actually have physical access to the story you're supposed to be writing about, right? So I had this incredible problem of my main subject is now, both of them are now in prison for a long period of time. Um, but I started to learn about a world in these prisons. There were bus trips that would drive families from poor neighborhoods in New York to these prisons. There were people in the visiting rooms that got to know one another that I would run into back on the street in the Bronx. I started to meet people. I asked Jessica um, who might be able to be a guide for me in the neighborhood uh, to try to reconstruct earlier parts of her life. I guess in anthropology you call it an informant. And she suggested that I call her sister-in-law Coco. Now, this is in 1993. I guess I've been on the trail of the story for about four years by this time. Um, and Coco went out with Jessica's little brother, Caesar. Um, I'm just going to briefly read a section to introduce Caesar. Um, Caesar, by this point, when I actually spent, begin to spend time with Coco, is in prison. He went in prison when he was a young man for an attempted murder. He got out. He got three girls pregnant. He went back in. Um, and he's back in prison by this point. I met him a few times when he was out, out on the street, but my real relationship with him began uh, while he was incarcerated. Not everyone survives being rescued. Caesar's nemesis lived in the tenement next door. Rocco was half Italian and nine years older than Caesar with thick, dark brown eyebrows that accentuated the funny repertoire of expressions animating his rubbery face. The first time they spoke, Caesar, who was then 12, was crying on the stoop with his head in his arms. The public display of vulnerability surprised Rocco. Caesar was famous around the neighborhood for taking punches with as much spirit as he dished them out. Rocco had heard the stories how Father Tom from the Christian church had barred him from game night for breaking windows, stealing pool balls, and whacking other kids with cues. Rocco had once watched Caesar take on a much older boy, easily twice his size. Caesar barreled into him with everything he had and didn't stop swinging until the guy left him in a heap. He always had a black eye or swollen lips and was always running with kids chasing him, Rocco said, bemused. That afternoon, Rocco asked what was wrong. It turned out that Caesar had a terrible toothache, probably from the candy he sometimes ate for breakfast. I think from there I started liking that crazy little kid, Rocco said. He would know Caesar for many years, but he never saw him cry again. The friendship took a while to develop. Rocco was training as a boxer, busy with his girlfriend, running around with a crew of guys his age, edging in and out of crime. Caesar was busy sprinting around the warm-up track of a criminal life, roofing other children's balls, stealing bikes, fighting, fighting, fighting. Sometimes Caesar watched Rocco practice boxing in the back alley or in the basement. Occasionally, they played handball together on the corner of Anthony Avenue at Caesar's elementary school. One summer night, Rocco was going to night pool. Night pool um, is when kids in the city break into public swimming pools at night. They just hop over the fence and go swimming. And Caesar, who just graduated from sixth grade, tried to tag along. 
The older boys were strapped, carrying guns, because they were a group of Puerto Ricans and the swimming pool was in Highbridge, a predominantly Dominican neighborhood. Caesar begged to go, but Rocco said he was too young for trouble. But then a few months passed and Caesar sprang up. Damn, Rocco said, you got big. How old are you now? Caesar lied and told Rocco he was 16. By the spring of 1987, as things fell apart at Caesar's mother's, the boys were hanging out in earnest. Rocco had time for Caesar, and Caesar gave Rocco a second childhood. When Rocco had been Caesar's age, his father wouldn't even let him outdoors on summer nights. Now they dropped eggs on unsuspecting pedestrians and hopped turnstiles and jumped onto moving subway cars and stole Chinese takeout and chased girls. I was 22 going on 12, Rocco said. He'd rap on Caesar's bedroom window from the fire escape when they had money that eat a late breakfast of beef patties and cocoa bread at Skibos, a Jamaican restaurant on Tremont Avenue, then head up to Moody's, Rocco's favorite record store. Rocco taught Caesar boxing moves and brought him along to Gleason's, his boxing gym in Brooklyn. Caesar jumped at any chance to prove worthy of Rocco's friendship. Rocco's role model had been his uncle Vinny. Vinny was a longtime heroin user with throat cancer and a fairly successful illegal career. Unlike Rocco's father, who did nothing but work and come home tired, Vinny exuded 70s cool, dark shades, long black hair slicked back into a ponytail, jailhouse tails and tattoos. Vinny had had a tracheotomy, and his raspy voice reminded Rocco of the Godfather. When Vinny told his nephew, I'm never going to die, Rocco believed him. His uncle Vinny had been in and out of prison, shot at, stabbed, and even hit by a city bus. <laughs> that's just the beginning of Rocco's life, I have to tell you. That's the edited version of Rocco's, I mean, Vinny's amazing life. Vinny told Rocco that he could succeed at crime as long as he stayed away from drugs and didn't trust anyone. Vinny raised me to be streetwise, Rocco said. Caesar said, Rocco raised me to be a criminal. By the time Caesar's stepfather left, Caesar and Rocco had renamed themselves two down and graduated to more serious crimes. Caesar didn't make it to junior high. This is the very beginning of Caesar's life. Caesar goes on um, to be quite a compelling figure in the book, surprising uh, me. I knew Caesar probably for about five years before we really began to have an open conversation. I would visit him very regularly with Coco in prison. Um, and I'm, do I have time to read from, yeah, from the Coco section? Um, the, the actual narrative direction of the book is really about my own journey, my incidental journey through this uh, neighborhood and this family. So, for example, I met Jessica. Jessica gets arrested. I start visiting Jessica. She introduces me to Coco. I meet Coco. I start to hang around with Coco. Coco, at this point, is in a homeless shelter, pregnant with her third child. She's 18. We start to hang out. We go to visit Caesar in prison. When I'm in prison visiting Caesar, I meet his friend Rocco. I start to visit Rocco. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's sort of like just a tree just branching off in every direction, and there's just more and more and more people. Um, I'm intoxicated with interest by this point, but I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Um, happily so, because if I knew what I was doing, I probably would have stopped at that point. Um, but it really was just a, a journey through a, a culture, I guess. Um, and what was so striking to me was how many of the people that I actually met in those first three years would sort of circle back around in, in the story of these people's lives. So in one way, it was the Bronx, this sort of iconic, blighted American ghetto. And yet, in other ways, it was really more like a small Irish village. Do you know what I mean? I actually, in the middle of the reporting, went to a small Irish village with a friend of mine, and I was stunned by how similar <laughs> I, the scene felt to me. Everybody, any time you went anywhere in this little village, everybody knew, and they would say to my friend, oh, Barbara, your friend Adrian, she just went down to the water and took a swim, and then she went to the pub and had a drink, and she talked to Mark, and she did. And I felt like I was in the Bronx, because that was sort of how it felt all the time to me. Everybody knew what everybody was doing all the time. Um, but Coco really then becomes the heart of the book, and I'd just like to introduce you to her now. Um, and this is at the very beginning. Uh, right when she spots Caesar for the first time, her love relationship with Caesar and Jessica's love relationship with Boy George really are, sort of form the engine of the narrative. Um, it sort of just follows them through... Um, I mean, they met each other when they were 14 and continue to this day to have a real strong connection. 
Coco lived in the heart of the inner city, but to her, it was more like a village. Her world was made up of roughly five square blocks. Its emotional center was her mother's apartment on the top floor of a six-story building off University Avenue. Just down the street was a high-rise housing project that staggered back toward the Deegan Expressway. The projects were another country. Coco traveled there only with her mother, Foxy, and her stepfather, Richie, who liked to do battle on the handball courts. There are important distinctions within the circumscribed world. Church people generally lived their lives separate from people who hung around outside. Some working people kept their kids on lockdown to protect them from the street. Some kids stayed outdoors, afraid of what awaited them inside. Everyone traversed the same stairwells and corner stores and bus stops, but sometimes moving in opposite directions. There was a kind of swing shift. The hanging out folks straggled home as the working people headed out. The working people returned just as the streets were heating up. Even within the households, these tensions persisted. Foxy worked full-time while Richie, her longtime boyfriend, was a heroin addict. Coco loved the street, but her older sister Iris was a homebody. Iris hated Foxy's boyfriend. Richie was unemployed, and because Iris stayed indoors, she got the brunt of his restlessness, some of which he subdued with heroin. Coco, on the other hand, concentrated on Richie's positive qualities. He was handsome, light-skinned, with blue eyes, and he and her mother matched. Foxy had green eyes and platinum blonde hair. They looked beautiful together when they danced, and he made her mother happy sometimes. Richie also took time to teach Coco the hustle. He was intelligent. He read books. He registered Coco for her first library card, and he helped her with her homework. Ever since her sister Iris had come out pregnant, Richie had been warning Coco to guard herself and aim for a better life. Exactly how she was supposed to do this was unclear, but Coco might have instinctively understood that success was less about climbing than about not falling down. Since there were few real options for mobility, people in Coco's world measured improvement in microscopic increments of better than whatever was worse. These tangible gradations mattered more than the cliched language of success that floated blandly out of everyone's mouth like fugitive sentiments from a Hallmark card. Girls were going to make something of themselves as soon as the baby was old enough. Boys were going to do right and stay inside. Everyone was going back to school. But better than was the true marker. Thick and fed was better than thin and hungry. Family fights indoors, you've heard this before, <laughs> um, were better than family fights outdoors. In, indoors were better than family fights outdoors where everyone could hear. Heroin was bad, but crack was worse. A girl who had four kids by two boys was better than a girl who had four by three. A boy who dealt drugs and helped his mom was better than a boy who was greedy and spent the income on himself. The same went for girls and their welfare checks. Mothers who went clubbing and didn't yell at their kids the next tired day were better than mothers who did. When Richie asked Coco about her plans for the future, whenever he asked her even a simple question, She'd say, I don't know. And he'd say, I don't know is going to be your middle name. Richie wanted Coco to think ahead, but his advice was vague. Always have a plan A, and behind that, have a plan B. I love that advice. That's the kind of advice teenagers get all the time. Strive to be better. <laughs> you always think, what does that mean? <sighs> Always have a plan A, and behind that, have a plan B. When it came to garnering heroin money, Richie worked the entire alphabet he had once fallen off a fire escape while attempting to rob a neighbor and broken both his wrists and ankles. He had then filed a lawsuit against the landlord, claiming that the fire escape was unsafe. He even enlisted the guy that he was robbing to testify in his behalf for a cut of the money. But uh, Coco could see that even the most inventive plans routinely failed and that Richie's needs still often came down to her mother's salary. Sometimes Coco would hand over her allowance to stop the arguing. She couldn't stand to see Foxy upset and Richie heroin sick. That chaotic autumn, Coco's only plan was Caesar, who had yet to speak to her. I was actually present when the lawsuit, you know, these lawsuits, I don't know if it's the same here, but in the inner city in America, everywhere are advertisements for lawyers, okay? So on matchbooks, on billboards, on bus station walls, it says, you know, have you slipped? Do you have a disability? Call now. The lawyer will take on the case for free. People sue and sue and sue. Um, and I actually, you know, this case went 
to, to, to court, and I was actually present when Richie received a $70,000 check for this um, failed attempted robbery, ankle-breaking event. And what was amazing, outside of just being around anyone who got, a, I guess, what is that, 60,000 euros or 50,000 euros? You know, just had a big check. And, that was, and the lawyer got a big check, too. But I think it may have been, I don't know how long it took them to spend it. It's in the book. I think, you know, three months on takeout food, leather coats for everybody, including the babies, were sort of outfitted in leather. The pit bull got a new collar, uh, the pit bulls. <laughs> um, we took cabs. Even if we were just going down the block, we would take a cab, and he would, like, tip the cab driver 20 bucks. Um, it was an amazing thing to watch, right? And, um, but by this point in the reporting, I actually under understood that. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I do remember at one point saying to Richie, hey, why are you going to tip the cab driver 25 bucks? The ride was only $5. Why are you going to give the guy $25? I remember he, he said to me, because it makes me feel like a man. He said, it makes me feel like a man. And he had, here's a guy who had, you know, his whole life had been dependent on women. You know, he's always hustling, just constantly conning and conniving. So there were those moments that um, were just real kinds of revelation for me. And um, the majority of the most useful insights came just by being there. I mean, just by clocking in the hours, because the most useful insights arose incidentally. So, for example, Coco and I spent a lot of time going to welfare appointments and styling her daughter's hair and watching, I don't know if you have it here, Sally, Jesse, Jesse Raphael, and Geraldo, and we watched every talk show all day long, and um, then would walk to the store, and as we're walking to the store, she would say, that's that girl that Caesar went out with when he was on the run, right? So then I would <laughs> scamper over to the girl, and I would say, excuse me, my name is Adrian. I'm a journalist. <laughs> I'm writing a book about what it means to be poor, and I wonder if I could talk to you about your relationship with Caesar. That would usually be my line. And a lot of times people would be like, what? Or they would look at Coco and say, is she for real? Is this, you know, they would be, and nine times out of ten people were totally open to it. But it was amazing because it was that sort of how I get to know people in the neighbor. Then I would go home with that girl eventually, right? I would go to her house and I would meet her mom and then I would learn something else about Caesar and you know what I mean? And just slowly piece together all these things. I didn't really know who I was even focusing on until um, my editor at the time said, every time I went to visit him, I would talk about Coco and Jessica when I was supposed to be writing about Boy George and the drug business. And he said, Adrian, clearly these women obsess you. Just why don't you write a book about them? And that was maybe in 1994. <laughs> That's like six years in to the project. Um, I'm not going to um, go on for too much longer about this. I could obviously go on for about it for a long time. It's sad to say after 483 pages. But um, somehow, it, like fast forwarding to 2001, um, which is when I actually, the book gets... Um, I don't know what you call it here, but orphaned. I mean, I had many, many editors, um, many publishers. At, I think in 1998, I got a letter from my then publisher that said, if you don't send us pages in six months, you owe us your advance. Um, I didn't have pages to send in at that point and um, got a new editor. And in 1998 is when I really started to realize I had a, to write a book, like that I couldn't just keep going out and amassing material and meeting people and experiencing um, this incredible world that really engaged me. Um, the book took probably about 18 months to actually write, um, and um, the organizational challenge of managing the notes was formidable. <laughs> and, and, I, and I lost so much material because I didn't really know how to make use of um, some kind of note-taking system. I had lots and lots of micro-cassettes, I interviewed people by tape a lot at the beginning. I would also give the kids I was writing about my tape recorder because I had to work. At the beginning, I had a job, so I would have to work in the morning, and I couldn't keep up with their hours because they were night hours. A lot of them would sort of sleep late and get up late, and the night, they would stay up through the night. And, um, and it wasn't any great idea I had by giving them these tapes, but part of the reason was Coco had a little brother whose task was always to take me to the subway because he was a tough kid, and uh, they felt if somebody sort of bothered me, he could handle it. But he was, um, at the very beginning, he was often flirting with girls, and usually around the time that I would need to go home, he would be making some progress, and I would always feel guilty that I had to interrupt this 
labor of attention that he was laying on whatever girl of the night it was. So like three o'clock in the morning, I have to leave, but he's just starting to really get to rap to her. And I'd be like, excuse me, do you mind, you know, bring me to the subway. So that the way that I started actually spending nights with the family and living in the home was I said, you know, I'm just going to go upstairs and crash on the couch and I'll get up in the morning at six or seven when it's safer for me to be in the train and I'll just go to work or, or go home. So that's literally how that, like I did spend time staying with them in their home. And that's, a lot of those things came up very practically because my, um, and at one point I actually had to sublet my apartment because I didn't have any money. And Coco was in a shelter and I actually stayed with her sometimes because I didn't have a place. My boyfriend and I, we were living in a basement then, do you remember? <laughs> It was horrible, but I was jumping around, and so sometimes I actually stayed with her because I had places to stay, but I couldn't always stay endlessly, Um, and so I had tape recordings, and I had notebooks, but the other thing that was amazing in this book is the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, was uh, investigating Boy George's drug operation for years, so they had surveillance videos, they had photographs, they had all the evidence, not only his cars and his jewelry, but they had the glass scenes from the heroin. They had the, a lot of the weapons. And the best thing that they had for a journalist was they had um, months of wiretaps. They actually tapped a lot of his phone lines. And many years later, Jessica, when she was in prison, gave me access to those phone tapes. So I had months of just mundane conversation on the phone during a time when I was not present. I heard her relationship with George. I heard her relationship with several lovers. I heard her interactions with the children, her interaction with her mom. Do you know what I mean? It was an extraordinary uh, resource for journalists. The other thing that was a huge help and is also in the book are these uh, prison letters. Since so many of the young men spend time in prison and since so many poor people in the U.S. don't have telephones, there's a lot of correspondence. So Caesar, for example, wrote daily letters to Coco from the time he was 14 until his early 20s, and she saved all of those letters. So they were incredible wealth, not only of information about his voice as a young man at certain times, but just information about what was happening to their families so that I could document chronology and I could actually reconstruct things from, um, you know, if he said my mom went to the hospital, I could place that hospitalization against five other recollected memories to figure out what had actually happened. Um, So I'm going to stop rambling. I don't know if you have (laughs) um, questions. Or am I, my time's up? Oh, let's move over there. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We had the same writing team. Well, as you can tell, um, it's very uh, entertaining is not the right word, but uh, engaging to uh, not only hear Adrian talk about it, but uh, to read her. Um, you can... It, 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 this this book is so multi-layered. Uh, you you can say it's a, a story about drugs. It's a story mm-hmm. about uh, family. It's a story about coming of age. It's a story about struggle against adversity that transcends the Bronx and could be mm-hmm. anywhere. Um, I'm, I'm going to try just one little thread out of it. Uh, I was struck by the fact that, uh, as, as you said, as your editor said, you know, this, this started to be a book about Boy George, about man, about the fast life. And then you move to the, the small life, mm-hmm. the ordinary life, the women. And in on the one hand, at first you think this is a feminist rendition because there are all these terrible things happening to women, you know, they get abused, um, uh, they are exploited, they try with their bodies to get some leverage, but you see sort of the, the um, you know, the end result. But while reading it, and I, I'm sort of interested in, in your own journey in terms of um, gender relations, in the end you, you portray the man who go into prison and become very wise Mm -hmm. and reflective and become philosophers. And then the women who are out there 
taking responsibility for the kids. They don't have time to become wise and responsible and to be philosophers. So, you know, I, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about those, those relationships between men and women and how you viewed that throughout your journey. Well, um, the thing that just also just immediately interested me about the women, the other thing, just Jessica as a, as a figure, was quite an extraordinary, I mean, she had an incredible sexual charisma, as I tried to describe, and just as a journalist following, it was really like following a celebrity down the street, do you know what I mean? She had, she just generated reactions from both men and women alike, all different sorts of people. It didn't matter if we were in her neighborhood, if we were in lower Manhattan, or if we were in Little Italy, or wherever, she just had an incredible sexual power. So that just sort of was compelling to me, um, to try to understand what it meant to, there was no shyness that she had about that, right? She was working it, and I was fascinated by what it meant to just be at the height of that kind of power as a woman, and completely conscious that it was something you could deploy, right? Because I often think women figure that out a little too late. <laughs> By the time you figure it out, you don't have it anymore. And um, so I was amazed that she was doing that. And um, but so there was like that interest. But um, the thing about the in prison and on the street is I think the one thing that prison granted the people in the book was that it, the one thing I just came to think about poverty is that it's a constant state of chaos, maybe low grade chaos or high grade, but it's constant crisis after crisis after crisis. And I describe it sort of like, do you know if you've ever been at the ocean and you're sort of waiting in the water and you get knocked down by a wave and you try to get up and you get slammed by another one and then there's a little gentle rolling wave and you sort of float from it and then you, another one crashes into you? It's sort of like that to me is the position of poverty. You're sort of always trying to get up and sometimes you get up and and so there's no time, there's no solitude, and there's no time for reflection, just by the sheer sort of state of life. Now, it's not that it's always dramatic crisis. It's often sometimes the incredible sense of boredom, which is blunting in another way. It's mind-numbing the boredom. But I think prison held 75% of the crises constant because they were powerless to help. So when Caesar went to prison, he couldn't help his mother's drug habit. He couldn't protect her from her lousy boyfriends. He couldn't worry about the rent. He couldn't manage his friends' battles. You know, so, and what he could do was deal with the baloney in prison and maybe read. But um, there was a way in which he was incapacitated. I think it's sort of like the equivalent of, um, you know, a, a, a very wealthy woman having a nervous breakdown. You know, the kids get sent to the aunt's house and the, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's just a way that they were relieved of responsibility and then, and then I think the growth began. I think the other thing was that they became educated in prison. And so many of them, for example, didn't speak Spanish uh, when we were on the street. But when they went to prison and started reading and learning about their heritage, they became politically interested. And I think the women were just still on that little hamster wagon of just coping. But Cope. it's sort of ironic to it, portray prison as you do. I mean, the letters that Caesar mm -hmm. sends from prison are poetic, they're wise, um, mm -hmm. they're insightful, and you realize that he is gaining insight, but is he able to use it ever? Right. Well, the thing is, I think if he stays in prison for much longer, I'm not sure what will happen. If he's able to get out before he's um, too old to become bitter, I think he could put some of it to use. But he has become the sort of, um, really, the philosopher of the family. Mm -hmm. I also think that perspective you know, there are kids in other stories I've done that actually envy young men that go to prison. Because as far as they can see, a guy goes to prison, right? He comes back physically built. He's smarter. A lot of young women on the street will say he, now he uses all these big words, right? Because they're actually reading in prison. A lot of them are reading like Machiavelli and they're reading like all these sort of Puerto Rican activists and they come out with this language that their girlfriends have never heard before. Um, and they have this incredible like focus because they've been locked up and at least for the first three to six months they're determined they're going to do something. So I think girls that are in that same drudgery, they look at it and plus they get to leave the city. And I'm not saying this lightly. I mean, it is sort of funny, but I've heard girls say, you know, he got to go to prison and he hangs out with his friends. They're out in the country. They play basketball all day, right? I mean, it's a perfect conservative argument, really. I mean, you could just... You know what I mean? It's very complicated, but I think there is an envy because, and they also meet other people, you know. Um, <laughs> it's dizzying. 
Um, I, I, the other question that that your your book evokes is mm -hmm. about um, your your writing style, mm -hmm. the your choice not to um, have yourself in the book mm -hmm. or to have um, you know a kind kind of exposition that explains the social context and so forth. Mm -hmm. You you do it through uh, the descriptions, but you you're not actually uh, introducing the um, the readers to it, and uh, there has been some criticism mm -hmm. um, that you don't make yourself part of the book, how disorienting it was, and so forth. Uh, can you say something about that choice yep. and what you gained and what you lost? I had very uh, there were very few things I knew during this process, but I knew that was one thing I didn't want to do. Um, there's a lot of, I didn't want a white girl goes to the ghetto book because I'm not the first and I won't be the last and I actually don't think it's that interesting. Um, and I think a lot of journalists, at least in the US, are now insert themselves into the narrative. And as a journalist, it always makes my antenna go up and I say, what didn't they get or what couldn't they access? Or, you know, why am I hearing about the journalists here? I want to hear about the story, right? So. That was one reason. The other thing is that if I were in the book, it would, I felt, assume that it was a world that required translation. And I felt that it was a world that on its own terms, you could be dropped into it as a reader and you could make your way. In the same way if I was writing about Wall Street, I wouldn't be in the narrative. Do you know what I mean? The assumption that I needed to be there had to do with class and race issues, I felt. Um, and the last reason was, I care passionately about social justice issues and I read quite extensively books that address these issues. And whenever I hit that expository billboard graph that says, you know, this many teen moms are pregnant or these are the contributing factors, I just feel like I'm dying. It's so hard to make those sections interesting, like the sort of dutiful analysis, sort of explanation. and. I feel people do that better than me, and that's not what I was doing. I wanted someone who didn't care about poverty, didn't, could care less, could actually pick up this book and read it and have a good read. And then people who cared about it could get something from it. But I felt that there's some kind of earnestness, right? Um, the, the other, I don't know what I lost from it. I think what I gained was um, more space, like more words because I wasn't actually taking up some of those words. But on the other hand, I think I'm all over the book. I think, you know, as a writer, you're just in every single thing you do. And I mean, when people say you're not in the book, I think I'm not in the book. It's like, I'm, where am I not in the book? I think I am the book, but, you know, but, so I don't know in a way. I, what, what, what would happen if, if your book um, became a classic? And I, mm -hmm. it is already a classic, but really uh, became a classic of literature. Mm -hmm and um, could be anywhere, um, but would not in any way inspire maybe new initiatives or another right. way of approaching. Mm -hmm. How would you feel about that? Well, I'm such to a pessimist that I don't think it's gonna do anything <laughs> anyway, but um, that would be great. I just would like to be around for the royalties if it became a classic, so I could make some money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I can't imagine. I mean, I don't know. The writing of it, I, I'm a, I tend to actually be more flowery in my writing than I was in this book, but the story was so dizzying. There were so many people and so much drama. It really was like a soap opera. Like, when you were describing it, it's, it's a very... Because I say to people, it sounds so depressing, but if you actually read it, it is depressing, but it's still life and it's still crazy. And it's, right. But when you actually describe what happens, like when you say by page six she's pregnant, and I whispered to my editor, and by page seven she's pregnant again with yeah. twins, and by page 12 she's pregnant yet yeah. again, it sounds absurd. So the writing had to be clean. Like yeah. it just had to be simple, because otherwise it... Can I, yeah. can I read one of my favorite passages? Yes. Because I think... You are in the in in, mm -hmm. in that uh, piece of writing, um, and uh, you already you already. Well, I mean, there's there there's so many favorite yeah. pieces. Uh, so go read it. There are gems all over. But this is um, one of them. This is when um, Coco and daughter Mercedes uh, go, and uh, this is in the prison. They come and visit Caesar, and this is at the end of a long visit. It was time to go, and Caesar pulls out. Um, a little um, piece of um, taffy. yeah taffy, you know, a sweet for his daughter, but instead of giving her the treat, 
Caesar teased the girl by offering the candy, then pulling it back, popping it into his mouth. The girl burst into tears. And Caesar then smothered, and this is the direct quote, smothered her hurt feelings with hugs. And then in the subtle tyranny of that moment beat the pulse of Caesar's neighborhood, the bid for attention, the undercurrent of hostility for so many small needs ignored and unmet, the pleasure of holding power, camouflaged in teasing, the rush of love. Then the moment passed, and Caesar's three-year-old daughter walked back out into the world and left him behind. I mean, that's you. I mean, that's so beautiful. It's, it's about parenting, and it's about, you know, in that one moment where you ca capture a whole history and then leave him powerless in the end. So it's also a story about you know, how power works and so well, forth. I also think, I don't know, they call this immersion journalism. I'm not sure. I just call it reporting. But our old teacher, Mark Kramer, that we had, um, has this, you know, he often says it, it's sort of like if you're a tea bag and the environment you're trying to write about is the hot water, right? And you, you, you dip yourself into it and you're trying to have that water flowing through you and you're affecting it and it's affecting you and all that. And then you have to come out of it and try to render it, right? So I feel like I'm in the book in the sense that I had to feel, like at that moment I remember being sort of, I had many, many feelings. Do you know what I mean? I had. I wanted the candy myself because I'd been sitting in a visiting room for six hours and I was hungry and tired, right? I noticed him pulling the taffy out of his mouth because he had this incredibly sexy mouth. He has these beautiful lips and he, oh, and he knows it and he always is like playing with that, right? I was feeling guilty because he was tyrannizing his daughter and I wasn't doing anything about it. And I was fascinated by it because I knew how much he loved this child. I knew in my gut because I knew him and I knew her, he loved this kid. And yet I was watching this sort of teasing and teasing always makes me uncomfortable and I was thinking, well, maybe I'm just a little uptight. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe this is, so all those things are sort of flowing through me. And, but it, over time I could actually begin to piece some of them together. But I feel like as a journalist, you have to be open to the feeling, and I think sometimes that's why it took me so long to write the book. Not that the story was hard to get, but that I didn't have the muscle to stomach the story that was there for me, because I had to feel a lot of things, and um, I wasn't strong enough to feel them so, you know, at so the beginning. Let's, so this piece, let's say mm -hmm. you observed that in 1996, right. seven? Mm -hmm. In a prison. In the prison, yeah. so then you took notes. Right, well, and you hadn't sorted out how you felt about no, no, that. I had no yeah. idea, but, yeah. but there were the challenge of taking notes in prison is occasionally I could get a note, you know, a piece of paper and a pencil in because it's totally erratic. There are all kind of rules, but as any journalist knows, some days they follow the rules, other times they don't. Many prisons in the state, in New York State, have children's sections, where there's usually just a corner, a filthy corner that has like broken toys. And, um, you can go up to the guard and get a, a piece of paper to play um, checkers or you can play sort of games, you know, tic-tac-toe, whatever. So I would go up and say, we're going to play tic-tac-toe. We'd get the games on the board and I would actually use the paper to take notes. Or I would take crayons from the children's section and write it. Then I would um, sometimes, for example, that day actually, um, I, no, she hadn't been born yet. There was another time when the baby had been born and the baby needed the diaper change. I said, let me go change the baby's diaper. So I go out to change the baby's diaper and I'm writing notes or I'm talking to a cassette to just keep as much as I can. And then Caesar would often call me later and I would revisit some of what had happened um, when I couldn't actually take notes thoroughly. Sometimes I would write in my hand. Wow. And sometimes <laughs> I would just be, there would be one thing that I wanted to remember and the whole visit, I would, because I don't have, I would just be saying it over and over and over in my brain, just trying to remember the exact quote, because I knew that was what I needed. So I would be talking and just trying to just keep it in my head. Do you know what I mean? Just for four hours, just don't forget it, you know? And um, that to me is so, you know, that's, that's the glamour of <laughs> You know, because you're trying, you want the exact phrase, you know, yeah. the way they said it was the way you have to remember it. 
Well, I think uh, there, there are so many aspects, but I want to open it up to the audience. Um, if anybody has a, a question for Adrian, yes. Well, I think, I find the famous thing comes up. Well, the, the question oh. was about, um, uh, you know, the willingness of the people to talk uh, to Adrian. Yeah. Um, I don't, at that age, how open was I? I don't, I think I was probably, had anyone paid close attention to me, I probably would have been very open. Because you're talking about a kind of a quality of attention that's probably mainly only comparable to like what your lover pays, gives you maybe for the first six months. Do you know what I mean? Like that total attention and they remember your mother's sister's name and all that stuff and then after a while it all starts to, no, maybe longer, I don't know, but like real attention where you're remembering things and, and so that's a powerful thing, right? Um, so there's that. I find more with wealthy teenagers than poor ones, that quest for fame becomes an incredibly tedious issue. Um, Boy George was using me, and I was least successful in my encounter with him, I would say, in a whole way. We had a very sort of typically repertorial interaction. He talked to me for a very pointed reason. He was, he was trying to argue he was a jewelry dealer. I was writing for Rolling Stone magazine. He was going to tell me his jewelry dealing story. I was going to be stupid and write the jewelry dealing story. That's what he thought. And then, you know what I'm saying? So. That was a different thing, but Caesar, I think, took six years before he started to talk to me. So I don't mean everybody just opened the doors. But um, I will say that I think sincere attention is, it's seductive, but I also think it's a very real, I mean, it's, I, I say, like, we have, if you have a great conversation with someone, like, a re, it could be a stranger, it could be your best friend, but you have a great conversation. It's, it's, it feeds you, or at least it feeds me, right? It's like reading a great book. You just feel en energized, and I think that happens in the field. I'm not saying it's the point of journalism, but um, that's the luxury of finding a story you, you sincerely care about. But the last thing I'll say is a lot of the kids, I would bring up my clips and I would say, you know, I'm a reporter and I would show them my articles to try to, because they thought I must be a real loser journalist to have been assigned the ghetto. <laughs> Their feeling was like, why would you be here? Like if I wasn't there to write about murder and drugs, really, like when it was clear that I wasn't following, like almost always when I've go gone to the inner city and you say I'm a journalist because it's pretty obvious, almost always they will tell you the worst things about that neighborhood. They'll say, you know, so-and-so got shot down that block and this happened there and there's, I remember the first day in Coco's neighborhood, this guy said to me, there's a girl who lives down the block, she has, you know, 12 kids, she's t two, you know what I mean, like that kind of story. And, and, and they would say, don't you want to know that? And I'd be like, I don't know, do I want to know that? Because that's the only reason why journalists historically go to those neighborhoods. You don't go there on Mother's Day to get quotes from, moms about, you know what I mean? Like, so there, so I, we were both learning something. I think people show off sometimes for a while, but you know, the sheer amount of time we all wore each other out. I mean, there was just a way that, it, I'm not saying that I ever got total access to anybody, right? I don't think that's, I don't think it's possible and I'm not looking for that. And if someone doesn't want to talk to me, I'm happy not to talk. I never pushed anyone. I mean, people that weren't receptive, I didn't push them. Um, but I also think that you get enough just by whatever you get. And I, you know, so you just have to have a working, I don't think anyone totally trusted me, but I think our interests were different. But I also have to say, some people are very curious about, um, so they want the opportunity for self-reflection. Coco was happy to think about her life. 
it never occurred to her, like when I said save your receipts because she'd get a welfare check and I was trying to figure out how much money she had and what she spent. And we were calculating it and she was saving, you know, things and she would say, it never had occurred to her that she didn't have enough money. She just always thought she was stupid about money. She never realized she didn't actually have enough money to buy what she needed. It never occurred to her and she actually found that really interesting to learn that she was in fact lacking money as opposed to being stupid. And those little things feed some people. Some people just find them. Jessica was very, very weary of the process. By the end, I don't think she would ever do it again. Coco would do it tomorrow, but Jessica would not, um, she hated it by the end. And I think she agreed to it because she was young and very narcissistic. And it changed over time. Okay. Marcia. Mm -hmm. Most of them have read it. Lourdes has not. Caesar told her not to read it because she would find it too painful. Um, we've talked about it, but um, yeah, pretty much everyone has read it. And I sort of answer this question by saying that they respond to it in character. So, um, for example, Jessica, who I say is narcissistic, she likes the beginning of the book, <laughs> and she does not like the end. Um, and uh, for those of you who will survive till the end, you'll understand a little bit of that. Um, Coco said to me, just tell me what page I'm on, pages I'm on, and I will read those. Because <laughs> she just doesn't really want to read the whole thing. And um, she doesn't have time. She doesn't right? have time to read the whole the thing. Kids. She works really hard and she has a lot of kids. But, but I also think Coco is a person who likes to believe in the, like in the same way with Richie, she likes to look on the sunny side. She wants to lo love me, I think, and wants to continue to love me freely. So she probably does not want to sit and know what's in this book, right? Probably. But she also sees it as my accomplishment, even though it's a book about her. Um, Caesar read it immediately. He got it and he stayed up all night and he called me and then he, the next night he read it again and he called me from prison the next day. He disagrees with my political analysis because he feels completely responsible for his life and he thinks I'm a bit too liberal. Um, but he was grateful for the information about his family and just things about what his children's bedrooms look like, what they eat for breakfast, you know, just stuff that as a dad who's incarcerated, he doesn't know. Um, well, because it took me so long, the statute of limitations on many of the crimes actually expired. So some more crimes got in there than would have gotten. Literally, they can't be convicted of crimes because the time's run out. Um, there are some affairs that are not in the book. <laughs> um, there's some sexual abuse that's not in the book. Oh, that is one thing I did not think about. I did not realize that children would be reading about their parents. That I worried about, I thought everything, but I forgot to worry about that. And um, the kids read the book really quickly. And uh, Mercedes, who is now 14, I, she was three when I met her, was lobbying her mother to be able to go out on dates. And at 13, her mom's saying no, and 14, she's saying no. And she's like, when you were 14, you and dad were at the Poconos having sex in a heart-shaped jacuzzi. You know what I mean? She like <laughs> learned that. And um, so there's funny things, but there's also sad things because Jessica didn't want her daughters to know about the extent of her love life. And um, lastly, I don't think some of the younger children understood their grandmother's behavior as drug related. I don't think they pieced together that the grandmothers were addicted. I think they knew that there was, you know, I'm sure they subconsciously knew, but I don't think some of those things, and I would, I don't know what I would do about that. I couldn't keep it out, but I never realized that stuff would, but one last thing, Mercedes, for example, has siblings from different fathers, but she never knew why. Nobody ever explained to her how that happened. So, okay, we have yeah. one question and then. Yeah. 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 No, it's just the strange. I'm very interested in how your book was received in the States. Did it become obscure? Did it start a discussion? Do you think that the Americans might have instigated a small change? Okay, so the question is this is for recording purposes. <laughs> what the uh, response was to your book, whether it has caused. Um, social change or the beginnings thereof? <laughs> no, I don't know about social change. It's definitely got a lot of response. I mean, it's done really well. Um, and it's received very differently by different populations, I think. So 
in my experience of doing events, I've been invited to an enormous number of nonprofits and groups of social workers and people that do this work. Um, and I put it this way, I guess in communities that share a lot of the experiences of the people I've written about, they see it as a book about strength and strong women and stamina and struggling. In middle class to upper middle class communities, they generally see it as a book about bad parenting and bad decision making. Um, <laughs> and um, I've gotten a little bit of flack from liberals who sort of feel like it's airing a little too much dirty laundry. And um, not a lot, but a little. And um, I don't know what the conservatives think. I haven't heard. I thought I was going to be like a poster <laughs> child for them, but um, that hasn't happened. I mean, it could go either way, I think. It's the kind of book you could use for your own devices. And, um, but I know, sadly, the kids in the book have come to events and been truly amazed by the response. I mean, because people are so amazed and they're so touched and they're so affected by the book. And they're like, Caesar was saying, what do you people think's going on up there? By that he means uptown. Like, what do you pe white people think is happening up there? Like, why do you think we're living the way we live? You know, they're amazed that people don't know about their lives. And um, because everybody they know lives the way they do, for the most part with the exception of Boy George. There, you know, Jessica would come to an event and there would be this outpouring of compassion and grief and pity and judgment. And she would leave the event and look at me and say, Adrian, my life ain't that bad. <laughs> I'd be like, I know, but they think it is. And, uh, but it's, that's been really interesting, how surprised they are at the, the community sort of thinks, well, thank God, you know, someone's sort of saying it. Yeah, so it's been mixed. You also told uh, us yesterday that actually you were surprised that they were not exploiting your book mm -hmm. of, you know, selling the story as their story or making a profit out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't seem to be part of their uh, idiom or mm -hmm. uh, they just don't, don't get it. No. So I mean, I think if it was made into a movie, there would be more. I think there is a more movie affinity. You know, I think the book is a, a book and there's a sort of, it means something, but I think a movie would mean something different. So, but that actually raises another interesting question, uh, that the audience, your, your intended audience of the book, is ultimately those middle class people mm -hmm. you know, uh, who need to learn about how the other right. half lives. Uh, had you ever intended that, or did you also have uh, an, uh, a hope or an expectation that it might be uh, instructive or in other ways for the community itself or well, I think what about I, that? this is why I, I feel like there's a lot of sentimentality in the way uh, liberals talk about poverty that you have to be a really admirable poor, poor person and I think um, the history of poverty literature in the states has often been about very very admirable poor people very church going you know self-sacrificing hyper rational super budgeting sexless poor women who just you know plow on through and I sort of want Poor people would be like as jerky as everyone else gets to be, as mystifying and, conf you know what I mean? Like I sort of think it doesn't matter what kind of person you are, the fact is that you're poor and the poverty isn't about your personality, even, you know what I mean, even though your decisions certainly compound it or diffuse the trouble. So I wanted to write about just regular poor people, but secondly, I thought I was writing a book that would just show people how hard it was to be poor, that it was not easy in fact to just pull yourself up, whatever that means. But sadly, what I think the book accomplished for middle class people is it just reminded them that poor people were human. And um, that surprised me, because I assumed that would be understood <laughs> in a way. But um, I'm being a little sarcastic. But, um, so, but the last thing I'll say is one girl, I think I told you this anecdote, one of Coco's sister-in-laws was reading the book, and I was saying, you know, a lot of people are very shocked by what's in the book. They're amazed. They're disturbed. It's educating people, and she just said, you know, she said, Adrian, she said, um, you always talk about these middle class people and how our lives are gonna educate them and how they're gonna understand and blah, blah, blah. And she said, I don't give a shit about those people. She said, sometimes I just wanna read a book about a girl like me, which was not what I was aiming for, but, um, and even if you figure in her kindness because she knows me, say 90% of it is baloney, it's still a compliment at 10%. Yeah. And um, I feel like I never thought of that. You know, um, so they're having a lot of success with the book with um, high school students that have trouble reading. So, for example, that I've been teaching a lot of high schools, and that's been great. Um, 
And a lot of kids in the Bronx, like uh, the public library has been doing these sort of groups with those kids to write about, you know, to see your life as literature. That kind of thing has been really great. Yes. My the question, yeah. sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, did you know what to uh, leave out of the story and what to, to keep? My problem was different with different people. So, for example, with Coco, my tendency was that I was more protective, right? And my editor, I had a great editor who understood. We had long talks, so she knew my great affection. But not protective in ways you might think, but there's a scene at the end of the book where there's this incredible infestation of roaches. The house is just infiltrated. And Coco worked really hard to keep her house clean, and I knew that that would be an embarrassing scene, right? Um, and I really grappled with the balance between wanting to show what slums they lived in, right? And that no amount of cleaning was going to stop this. So there were, but I would er tend to be more protective in that way, although I ended up putting that in the book. Um, with Frankie, who was a, a boyfriend of hers at the end of the book, I was hard on him the whole time. I had to learn to be more empathic with him. Um, with Caesar, I tended to um, feel that, I, I, I tended to be more clipped in the writing. So he would tell me things and I would say, well, that's that. And sometimes my editor would say, you have to go back and ask him, Adrian. I mean, that's not that. Do you know what I mean? Like, there were, so it was more like um, I had different problems with different people. But my editor was essential in that process. I mean, I had so many scenes. I think I had like 25 prison visit scenes that we had to narrow down to two. It was just, and I, in the, in the poor woman, um, I just needed someone else on the planet Earth to hear the other 23, and she did. <laughs> Even though we knew they had to go, I just wanted some other human being to just recognize that they existed. So, and whole people are filtered out. I mean, there's probably 20 people that I reported on that don't even make a single sentence appearance. You know? No, no. And that's one complaint they did have, that the book is, they would be like, this is it? all that time, like, this is all you wrote about? And I would just be like, this is enough. People have had, they can't take any more. I remember when Coco was pregnant with her third child, and there are several more to go, if you haven't finished the book. She's like, this is it, end it here, I'm ending it, end the book at three. <laughs> I don't want to have any more kids in the book. I'd be like, how about not having more kids in life? But, um, but it was funny, like, we would have those conversations, but so much time just kept lurching along. Sure. It sold foreign rights, I think, in five, five countries. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, that's good. Which one? Oh, dizzying. Oh, Taft. I've been in the halls of Taft. <laughs> wow, wow. That's a big high school. Yeah, it's a scary ghetto monstrosity. It's a There's a reason, though. There are two reasons. Um, one, there, there's, a, there's a question, a very interesting yeah. question that actually crossed my mind about the parallels between ethnographic studies, uh, dissertation, academic work, and how you, re, how you um, write about it, mm -hmm. and your kind of work, which is also ethnographic, but is at the same time is, um, uh, can we say, literary journalism. Mm -hmm. So, this, this no, but you. <laughs> But you were amazed the, about just 18 months, right? So it's about the you process know what of it writing. Was? That high quality cocaine that they were selling on the corner? No. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. It was a deadline. If you had a supervisor that was really on your butt with a check at the end, you might hustle more. You know what I'm saying? Yeah.
culture with a little c. <laughs> and in Massachusetts accent at the end, so it's culture. culture. C-U-T-L-A-H. <laughs> no, I take what you're saying to account. I don't use it in, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I don't even know how to enter into those conversations anymore, I have to say. I just, um, but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Okay, we have a question there and then over there. Yes. So the question is, do the, the, the people in the book realize that they are part of a welfare system and who is paying for that? That was the question. It's a good question. Um, they certainly know they're on welfare because it's incredibly, I mean most, I think, I think it's fair to say nearly everyone in the book is now off of welfare. I'd have to think through the peripheral people, but all the main people are no longer on, on welfare. And actually, Coco just got this incredible Employee of the Year award from this company that's a national company, right? So she's ex quite distinguished herself as a, as a worker in the past four years. Um, it's, nobody wants to be on welfare, and it's a drag to be on welfare because it's incredibly time consuming. At the end of the day, you don't have enough money to survive, but do they know who's paying for it? I don't know the answer to that question. I never, it never occurred to me to ask them. Um, it never occurred to me to ask them. <laughs> it's a good question. I should ask them, but it never occurred to me. I, I just kept thinking, I'll tell you one moment when I was having a moment as an extremely liberal person. Um, I was with Coco and she was shopping. She just got her food stamp check and we went to this place called Sea Town, and she was, um, throwing food in her carriage, and I mean grabbing off the shelf, thrown in the carriage. And I was raised in a family with the coupons and the buy the stuff when it's on sale and store it. Do you know what I mean? My mother, like, shopping was a very conscious experience. I'd never in my life seen anybody shop. I don't even, till this day, I walk straight to the sale rack. You know what I mean? And I was just overcome with, I was angry, I was envious, I was amazed, I was judgmental, I was feeling all this stuff because she was just whipping stuff into the cart, do you know what I mean? And I thought, if I feel this way, and I'm this incredibly liberal person who actually is incredibly fond of this person and knows so much about how hard her life is, how on earth can one expect a sort of working woman, right, who's just worked for minimum wage, who's behind her in line, who's not getting food stamps, blah, blah, blah. And I just remember thinking a lot about that. and. For me, the thing was that I understood that she was paying for it with her life. Like that was a certain, she was just paying for it all with her very life is sort of how I came to see it. And, um, and there was, and she needed the support and she, you know, that's sort of how I came to place it. But those moments were my inability to, I wanted to believe that it was something other than it was, which was a young woman in need. I wanted to believe that she was somehow complicit in her own vulnerability in a way that, in fact, I don't believe she was. Um, but I think my emotional response was connected to that a little bit. Okay. We have one more question and then we'll, we're closing up.
So the question is if there are any responses in terms of class from people who are higher up in the, on the social ladder in the, in the um, Puerto Rico community. I, you know, I've met, um, I'm not sure exactly who those people are, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I can imagine who some of them are, certainly. Um, I know that um, several um, writers came to some of my events um, and said that they had been flooded with phone messages when the book sort of hit. And the question I was asked was, why did I choose to write about the, the chronically poor as opposed to the ones that were? Like, there are siblings in the book who, in fact, do a, a bit better than, you know what I mean? There, there are siblings in all this who actually have very different experiences than the folks I concentrated on. Why did I choose to write about the ones who were caught in the backwash? Um, that's been a, a constant question. And I, but I've talked to, like, you know, the head of the Bronx, um, the Bronx Borough President, political um, leaders have been very interested in um, trying to figure out a way to both use it as a literacy, something in a literacy campaign, but also to generate real discussion about um, the sort of systemic needs of the community. But I haven't sort of had a, I don't really have a sense. It hasn't been translated into Spanish yet, and I actually think some of that is like, a, it will be a delayed. Um, but the most, you know, oftentimes the most violent attacks I've gotten have been people who haven't read the book, and I don't, I'm not saying it means they wouldn't still hate the book if they read it, but it's very rare that they sort of, and they also just make a lot of assumptions about my background, which aren't accurate. Um, so, but I also just think that's another one of those conversations, you know, that we all know where it, it, it tends to go down a certain road, and you can go down that road, but I just don't know where it takes you. I sort of think the a answer to that ultimately is to recruit young writers, right? You gotta get people writing. You gotta get more young people writing about their experience wherever they come from. So. Okay, Adrian, well, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. Um. Well, thank you, Adrian, for bringing um, these stories to Amsterdam, and uh, I think you did a wonderful job. Thank you, Ruth, for uh, introducing and interviewing uh, Adrian. Thanks to the Arbeiters Press, who did, I think, a great job by bringing the book to Holland and translating it, and helping me out together with Van Dittmar to make this evening possible. Before I leave you, uh, also to Adrian, because she will sign her book here, uh, two announcements, because we'll have two literary events in May coming up. Um, the first one is Siri Hustvet on May 12th, and the other day is Paul Oster, May 13th, in the Rode Hood. Uh, you are very welcome to sign up and um, maybe have a look at our information stand to know more about the John Adams Institute. Um, so, for now, thank you very much for coming all. I think it was a very remarkable evening, thanks to both of you. And um, thanks for coming and hope to see you again soon. Bye. <laughs>